everybody and welcome. How's everybody doing tonight? Let me know in the chat how you're feeling today. Also, let me in the chat, let me know if you're already on winter break. So, don't know what to do with absent students? That's what we're talking about today. My name is Scott, and you're watching Immediate Immersion Live, where we talk about comprehension-based instruction, grading and assessment, building student relationships, and classroom management for the modern language classroom. We'll be right back after this short intro. So welcome back and we're talking about absent students today. Again, if you're just joining us, please let me know how you're feeling today. And if you're already on winter break, for me, winter break starts on Wednesday. So Wednesday's our last day of school and I have Thursday, Friday off and then I don't go back until January 9th. I am so looking forward to my break. I've needed it. Um, November was a really bad month for me. So I'm hoping to get everything much better going along. So let's talk about those absent students. I don't know about you, but especially since the pandemic, I have had more students be absent than ever before. And not just a day here or a day there, but like a week or more at a time. It's not uncommon for kids to be gone three, four, five, six, seven days in a row before coming back. I don't know if they're legitimately sick, if they're um, taking an undisclosed uh, vacation, or um, if they're just being cautious because they are sick and they don't know if it's COVID or COVID related, or they don't want to spread it or don't want to, you know, any of those kinds of things. I'm not sure. But I know I've been dealing with a heck of a lot more absent students than before. Elizabeth says, hello, Scott, getting ready for the first day of school, day off of school. Uh, and 30 wind chill in Missouri this Thursday. And that's why I don't live in Missouri. I have family who lives in Missouri. I grew up in Michigan. I do not like the cold. I moved to California when I was 20 and I haven't looked back. Um, I'm in Northern California, so we do have a winter. Um, I have to go about a half an hour north to get to snow, which I never do. Um, and we're about, you know, in the 2030s in the morning, but warm up into the 50s um, by the afternoon. So that's okay. Still a little cold for me, but I can manage. Definitely aren't going to be doing the negative 30 with the windshield. No, thank you. Elizabeth says, same here. So, um, with my absentee students, we have something in California because it's the bane of all of our existence at school, something called independent study. I don't know if it, they have it in other states. I know I taught in Nevada. We did not have it. Um, but California is really strict about attendance because they don't want to get ripped off. I know in Nevada, we had something called count day that they would not process any kids who have moved, any suspensions, I mean, not suspensions, excuse me, any expulsions um, until after count day. So they could count all these students. And then on count day, we give them an accurate, or an accurate count of everybody in class. Um, and then they submit that to the state. And then the state pays the schools based on that number. Well, Schools fudge on that. As I said, they don't process kids who've moved out of district. They don't process kids who uh, may be expelled. So California can't afford that. So what it does is we have a monthly attendance. And if a kid is missed more than one hour of the school day, it's as if they're absent the entire day. And at the end of each month, we submit our attendance records and we get paid based on those. So it's really, uh, so attendance is really a big thing. So when it comes to kids taking vacations in the middle of the school year, anything over three days that they disclose, they don't always disclose it. If it's not disclosed, it goes as an unexcused absence. But if they disclose it, 
we can give them up to 15 days off. But they, it's called an independent study. They have to do some work, and we have to have evidence of that work to turn into the state so that we get attendance credit for those kids. We never let them go longer than 15 days, even if they're going to take, like we have some kids who might like go to India or to the Ukraine for multiple weeks. Um, we cut them off at 15. So even if they don't come back, we only give them credit for 15 days. Anything beyond that's unexcused. And the reason is the California law says if we approve anything over 15 days, we have to create a one-on-one -on -one instruction time with them. So that means they have to make up the time and we have to do it on our own time, which we're not going to do because they chose to take a school vacation. So that's one of the things that we have to deal with is writing up these lesson plans for kids, things the kids have to do while they're going on these vacations. Those are at least pre-planned and they're easier to deal with. They're a pain in the butt to deal with, but they're easier because I know in advance that they're going and I can think about more conscientious things. The biggest problem that most of us, and if you agree with me, if you've got the same problem, let me know in the, the chat, is just the kids who are absent here or there, uh, who are frequent, not the kids who are gone just one or two days and they're usually here all the time, but the kids who are like, here today, gone tomorrow, here today, gone tomorrow. Those types of kids, kids take two, three days, they come back for a day or two, then they go back out again. These kids, um, I have a lot of them this year, um, they really start to fall behind and it's really, really hard to accommodate them. So we've got those types of kids. We've got our independent study types of kids, the kids who take vacations in the middle of the school year. And then we've got the, the regular kids who are just sick for a few days and then come back. And we're going to deal with each one of these in a different way. So, hola, Neil. This is one of my ex-students. <laughs> um, do many students take advantage of these 15 days distance work? Yes, it's a real problem, Elizabeth. Um, like right now, our secretary has about 10 of these on her plate that she's dealing with. I have um, one kid who's been out all last week and is out this week as well, and he won't be back until three days after we get back from winter break. I believe he's going to India. I have another one. This one's more legitimate. He needs foot surgery, and so um, he took off three weeks before winter break, and he's taking three weeks after winter break. So that's six, seven, eight, almost nine weeks that he's taking total. But at least that one's more understandable. It's a medical issue. Um, but we have a lot of kids. Yeah, 15 days off. It's not really distance learning because we don't have to do that distance type learning until the 16th day. And we never approve that. So we never have to worry about that. So we do have a lot of kids. Um, you know, we give them a few extra days for vacation and they take even more. Uh, during Thanksgiving, you know, normally when I grew up in all my schools, except for the one I currently at, um, only had Thursday, Friday off. But because kids had Thursday, Friday off and they were taking Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off, and that was hurting our attendance numbers, we went ahead and gave the whole week off at the same time. So now they get the whole week of Thanksgiving. But again, for some, that's not enough. They'll take a few days before Thanksgiving break, and they'll take a few days after Thanksgiving break. You give them something, and they always take more. So it is a problem at our school, and independent study is not only a big issue for the teachers. It's also for our secretary who's going to process all the paperwork. And about 90% of our kids don't do the work, so the absences just turn to unexcused absences anyway. I agree. Health issues, I understand. But vacations, we have enough vacation time built into the school year. that, And the, we give out our calendar a year in advance. So it's not like we're surprising them in, in the fall. that That's when the calendar comes out. The calendar comes out a year in advance. So they know what when the breaks are and they can schedule them around that. 
a lot of our kids like to take the week when we come after we come back from winter break because the Disneyland lines are lower. They all like to go to Disneyland and everybody it's really busy during the winter break, but if they go the week after winter break, the lines are smaller so they like to go then. So I'm telling you, education's not always a priority. So here's my first solution and it's the easiest one to implement. And this only works for the kids who are gone a day or two at a time. They're not gone for an extended period. And that's to actively review with them. When you actively review with them, so let's say you started a story yesterday. And now you brought the kids in. The kids comes back today and he missed that part of the story. So you're going to review that story almost like telling the story and then involving the student who is absent in the review as if there were no other students in the room. So you're really hyper-focusing on that student or the few students who were absent. So for example, let's say we had a story yesterday and we said, um, there was a bear and his name was Bob and he had 15 years and he liked to eat fish. So then I'm going to just quickly review that. Elizabeth said 90% of students not engaged. Not surprising to me from my experience as a teacher. Absolutely, Elizabeth. Absolutely. So I'm going to review this. Say, class, there was a bear. And then my absent student is Susie. Susie, was there a bear or was there a donkey? That's right, there is a bear. In class, what was his name again? Oh, that's right, his name was Bob. Susie, what was the bear's name? Bob. Susie, was the donkey's name Bob or was the bear's name Bob? Oh, the bear was named Bob. Class, remind me, how old was this bear? Oh, it was 15 years old. Susie, was the bear 12? No. Was the bear 17? No. Was the bear 15? Yes, that's right. So you see how I'm pulling her back into the story, reviewing it with the class, but really... I'm reviewing it for the benefit of Susie, who was absent. That's the easiest way to get those absent students back in. And if they're an average and above student, that should be just enough for them. And if they're only gone a couple of days, again, this would work really well. What is... Harder is when the kids are, long, are gone for an extended period of time. And so let's talk about that section next. That will be, let's talk about the notes. So one of the things I like to do in my classroom. Hello, welcome, Karen. Hola, Scott started a break after the 16th. Glad to be here. Glad to have you with us. And I hope you're enjoying your break. I've got a few more days. Ours officially starts on the 22nd. So the 21st is our last day. So I am really, really looking forward to it. So notes. When I write words on the board to help kids understand, I prefer to type them on a Google Doc for many reasons. But one of the greatest reasons is for absent students. So, um, I will make a Google Doc. I will make a table with two columns. I will color one side one color and the other column a different color. And so when I type, it automatically will change the colors for me. I'll type the target word, language word and then the English on the other side. And I have a running document of the lesson. I keep this one running document per class. So I have a period one document, a period two document, a period three document, etc. I will do a page break and put the date in there when I start a new day. And I make this available to my students on our learning management system. 
So they just have to click on it and find the date that they missed and they can see all the vocabulary that was used that day. This is not a vocabulary list that they have to memorize. It was just my vocabulary I had to write on the board to make what I was talking about understandable. So that will be there and they always have access to it. And what's great about having only one doc and just putting the date breaks as you have the dates is that you don't have to keep changing the links. You post the links once at the beginning of the year and those links stay the same for each class all year long. And because it's running vocabulary, um, you know, not the vocabulary list, but the running vocabulary of what we talked about in class, kids can always go to the date that they missed. They can all see the words and be up to date when they come back, at least be familiar with some of those words that we talked about um, the days they were gone. Another way that I do notes is we often do a write and discuss, especially after a story or a reading. So we'll clear the reading off the page so they can't see the reading. And then we, or we will clear our minds of the story for a moment and we're gonna review. I'm gonna ask leading questions to get us to review either the story or the reading. It's also great for novel chapters. And then as the kids answer the questions, I'm slowly typing up again on a Google Doc the summary of what we're saying. The kids give me the sentences. I'll fix them before I write them down. And then the kids who are actively in class are going to copy those sentences down into their notebook. And we'll talk again. We'll be reviewing the story, the novel chapter, or the reading, but I'm creating a Google Doc, which again, I can share with my absent students so they don't feel like they're falling behind. So those are two things, the first two things that I do, and it requires no extra work on my part. It's something that I already always do. Another thing with notes you can do is you can have um, students, if you're, take, if you're actually having kids take notes, you can have another student give you a copy of their notes that you can make a copy of. You can either take it to the copy machine and make a quick copy for them, or I have you know one of those all-in-one printer things in my classroom. I can just take their notes, put it on the scanner, and make a, a quick copy of the notes so I can have them for the student. If the kids are taking their own notes, you find a kid who takes good notes and then you can have them copy that down. That usually works when we talk about we're doing culture because I'm not writing anything culture, I'm doing a presentation, but kids are taking notes about the culture. Any questions or suggestions? about the review technique or the notes before we move on to video. Okay, well, if anything comes in, I'll be sure to address it. Let's talk about video. This is something that I do every once in a while. I also do it when I'm going to be absent. If I know in advance I'm gonna be absent, I might make an entire video lesson, like record a whole class, um, and then the sub can just play, the, play it. That works really, really well. Um, but otherwise, you can either video your live class, and then you want to make sure that you're not including any faces of students. So I usually will put like a camera um, in the back of the room and zoom it in to the front of the room where I'm teaching from. And all I'm getting is the back of the heads of students. Otherwise, if you get a student in there, you're going to have to blur out their face unless you have um, permission to record them.
Elizabeth says, I sometimes record the story so far and post the audio. That's also a very good solution, Elizabeth. And that's what we're going to come up with um, in just a moment. It comes up at the end here, the video lessons. But that's a great um, idea. And I will be talking about that because that's one of the things I do as well. So you can, as I said, you can videotape a whole lesson. You can do it while you're doing it live with students. Or you can just make a personal video for that. Now, I tend to do this, this personal video, when I'm having multiple students out for a lengthier period of time. So that way I can make one video and I can share it with all the students. If it's just one or two students, it's really not worth my time to create a video. I'll just record a class. But again, it only helps if I know they're going to be out for a long, if it's a day or two, it's not really worth the effort. But recording a class, I'm already doing the class because I've got to put the camera up. Um, but creating a video where I'm actually trying to teach the kids who are gone without having to go on Zoom and plan that whole thing on my off hours, I can do this during my prep time. Um, I can do that if I know more than a few kids are going to be gone and for an extended period of time. Elizabeth adds, I also, like you, film my story asking camera on me in the board. Yes. I do that a lot just for my own edificacy so that I can see how I'm teaching and mistakes I make and things I could do better. Um, but often, yes, I can use that for students. So it really, really works well. Um, when I did this a lot, I kept the camera in the back of the room and I recorded every day. So the kids didn't like act up for the camera because the camera was on every day. It started just to get old. Um, and they never worried about it. But if all of a sudden I put the camera in the middle of the room and they see it, they kind of like ham it up, which kind of, it makes a real big distraction. So I've always, if I'm going to do it, I always keep the camera in the back of the room and I turn it on all the time. Um, Elizabeth says, I started doing that in 2021. Many students quarantined. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. When we did a lot of Zoom stuff during that time when they were quarantined a lot. So that's my other thing. Either record your class or record a special mini lesson that just focuses on the important parts with those students. And again, that one, when you're doing it, that focus little lesson, it's when you know that multiple students are going to be gone, not just one or two students. It's a lot of extra work for that. But like in the quarantine situation or when I know, like, we've been having a lot of kids be out in the last couple of weeks because we have colds, flus, COVID, and respiratory, what do they call it, Our respiratory syndrome. That is another thing going around. So we've had a lot of absences. So I'm tending to create these lessons this way. So that is what to do to get the kids caught up to where you are. But now let's switch gears and let's talk about what we can have kids do as makeup work. And this is some stuff that um, Elizabeth already kind of mentioned. Karen says, sounds like a lot of extra work for you. It can be, but it doesn't take me very long to do some of these things. And as I said, just to put a camera up in the back of the room is really easy to do. I don't edit it. I just post the whole thing as it is. Um, I have a camcorder, just records in the back. I just post it as it as is. Um, it does take a little bit more effort if I am going to make a you know concerted F, uh, video for those particular kids. But again, it doesn't happen very often when I get a lot of... Um, unless I get a lot of kids that are going to be absent. Elizabeth says, it is, Karen. I teach seven different courses every day. I can't imagine that, Elizabeth. I have three preps, which, is that the most I've ever had? I may have had four at one time. Level one, level two, and Heritage Speakers one and two. 
four may have been my max I've had. Um, we're lucky as Spanish teachers that we don't, don't have to teach all levels like French and German, Mandarin often do. Um, but I teach three classes for the day and there are certain classes that are more likely to have absent students in than others for whatever reason. Um, my threes, I don't have as many absences. They're more conscientious. Even if they're sick, they don't want to miss any school. So they really work to get back to school where my 1B class, you know, school is not their priority. So if they're going to be sick, they're going to be sick as long as they their parents will let them stay home for. And that's a whole different situation. But it can be um, a lot of work. But the alternative is if you end up failing a kid because they were so absent, that can also cause a problem depending on your school culture. If the parents go to the administration about that, saying you weren't very, being very accommodating, um, if you know, you're not allowed to fail a student because of absences, there are other things that can rear their ugly heads. So I try to be as accommodating as possible up to a point. I mean, I did have a parent ask because they were going on vacation that if I could stay after school the next week, one hour a day to tutor the student. And that was not, I was not going to do that. I'm not going to stay after school one hour a day to teach one-on-one -on -one with a student because the parents made a conscious choice to go to Hawaii during the school year. That's not my issue. There are certain points that I'll go to, and my my administrator would never have faulted me for that anyway. Um, but go, doing other things, they're going to say, what have you done to help the absent student? That would have been a line. Elizabeth says it takes time to process, save, upload. But once you have the template page on your um, learning management system, it goes faster. Yes, it doesn't take um, uploading is probably the longest part. I usually upload at home because school Internet is very, very slow. But I do have, you know, I don't process the videos because I said I just take them as is. I don't edit them at all because when you edit, then it does take a while to process the video. I just take it right out of the camera and I upload it as is. Elizabeth says one posted page for each. French one, French two, French three through four, Spanish two, Spanish three, four. That is a lot of classes, Elizabeth. I am so sorry. Oh, and I forgot to mention another thing that I do. Completely slipped my mind. I have an absent manager that's a student job and that student's responsible for gathering any papers that were handed out for that student while um, they were gone, whether they were papers being returned back to the student or new handouts. And also just to keep track of what we did on a daily basis. So when the kid comes back, they can give them the gist. They can say, here are your papers. Here are the handouts. This is what we did on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So that's a student job that they do that. That is also very helpful. And back when we used a different learning management system um, where my students could post to it, they would post what we did each, each day on the calendar. The way our learning management system now works, it, they can't do that. So they just keep notes and they tell them when they come back. But in previous learning management system, they would go to the calendar. They would type in the notes for the day of the calendar and someone could look that up. Elizabeth said, if a student was out for health reasons, I wouldn't uh, mind staying to help. But for family vacations, I agree with you, Scott. And I'm with you. Health reasons, um, same thing. Um, most of our health reasons, if they go out for a really extended then they get a special teacher assigned to them. It's called like something hospital stay. I forgot what it's called. I did that for a student when I first started teaching. Um, a student had brittle bone disease and broke both arms and a leg. So there was no way they could function. They couldn't function in a wheelchair. They couldn't use crutches. They had to stay home. So I went to their house once a week 
to get them caught up in Spanish. I wasn't their Spanish teacher. Um, they got to choose whether they wanted someone else or their Spanish teacher. I guess they didn't get along with their Spanish teacher. So they asked for someone else and, you know, I was selected. So I went in once a week and I did that. And that was when they're on with that hospital stay, even though he wasn't in the hospital. So for extended health, that's what we do for those students. And a, a teacher is, um, is hired and assigned to them to do that, whether it be one teacher teaches multi-subjects or a teacher for each subject. And I am more inclined to go out of my way for health reasons, but not vacations. And that's what most of our kids are doing. They're going on vacations. We live within two hours of Lake Tahoe. They want to go skiing or snowboarding. So they do all of that stuff. Elizabeth says, all of the CI pros I follow assign jobs. I know I should do it, but it's very difficult for me to follow through with this method for some reason. I turn it all over to the students, actually, uh, Elizabeth. We'll just talk about it really quickly before we move on. Um, every month we do a different, I send out a sign-up sheet. The kids sign up for their jobs. They're responsible to do their jobs. Um, they get paid a salary and profe points. Um, and I have a banker, a payroll person, who pays out the points. So it's really not a lot off me. I just have to remember, ooh, it's the first, you know, first of the month. I got to pass out the paper so kids can sign up for their jobs. And I just have to figure out which jobs are useful to me. And Kelly Ferguson told me, and I loved the, the, the thought behind it, was if it's something that does not require a college degree to complete, that's a student job. So I have making copies, I have running errands, I have turning on and off the lights, I have passing out papers, I have, you know, cleaning up the floor, uh, making sure all the chairs are pushed to put, put away. All those things are student jobs and I just got into a system. I didn't always use them. I think this might be my sixth or seventh year doing them, but it really has taken a lot of load off of my um, like, you know, writing up things on the agenda. I have someone do that. Um, we're putting the date up on the board. I have someone do that. All of those things I have someone do, and it makes my life so much easier. So all I've got to focus on is actually teaching. So I highly recommend, um, that you find some way to work it into your style. And I think I have a, um, I do have a one of these live videos on classroom jobs you can go back and search on YouTube and find. Yes, it was funny. That's a new job for this year. I used to hate getting all the points together and counting them out because it's like I'm passing out 300 points per class period per month. So cutting them and, and counting them just took me forever. So now I just cut them all up and I have them in a big old bucket. And my, I give it to the banker, and then they pass it out, the payroll person. And so they like doing it. It's an easy 10 points for them for the month, and I don't have to do it. So it saves me tons of time. I love it. And now I've switched over to virtual points using Class Dojo. And so now it's even easier to give out points. Um, Elizabeth asks... Um, do all the jobs get filled? Almost all of them. What I usually say is, whatever's not filled, the kids who didn't sign up for a job, I'm going to randomly pick and fill in the holes. And so usually the, the worst jobs have the most points. So cleaning up the floor, rearranging the chairs, those are all like 25-point jobs. Um, the easy, fun jobs are 10 points. There's nothing that gets less than 10 points. Okay, let's go on back to our topic. So sorry, I digressed there. Um, listening activity. So these are now makeup assignments that we do as students. So I will create, and I can create these way in advance. And as part of my curriculum that, um, excuse me, I have available on immediateimmersion.com, there are listening and reading activities that you can assign for homework 
or do as in-class activities, whatever you wish to do. But I record them on an app called, and I'm going to type it in the chat here, soundtrap.com. Elizabeth says, sorry, I missed your jobs video. No worries. It is available. You can go on YouTube and find it and watch it at your leisure. Not a problem. Soundtrap. I love this app. I used to use GarageBand, but this is a little bit better. It's better because it's online. I can use it wherever I am. I don't have to be on my Mac. And I can record and save them. See, with GarageBand, they save. But where I saved them, who knows? And I didn't always, I couldn't always remember where they were, so I ended up recording things multiple times. So here with Soundtrap, they do charge for the app, but I've never had to pay. They have a free version, and all I have to do is click out of, do you want to upgrade? I click out of it, no, every time I've used it for many years without ever paying. I record my listening. I can put it in folders, so I have a Spanish 1 folder, a Spanish 2 folder, a Spanish 3 folder. I can save it in the folder. I can also download it. I can upload it to my LMS, but I never have to worry about finding it again because all I have to do is log into my account and Soundtrap, and it's right there in the proper folder. And so I do this with my listening assessments as well as my listening activities. The difference is I just don't post my listening uh, assessments. I will take my activities. I can post them on my learning on my LMS, my learning management system, and kids can access them. They can listen to them as many times as they want and then answer comprehension questions about them. So like Elizabeth said earlier that she records her story up to that point, it's the same thing, except I'm going to record the story and then I'm going to have comprehension questions that go along with it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the story we did in class. As long as it's working with the same vocabulary and structures, it will work. Because remember, the point is not to teach the story. The point is to teach the structures and vocabulary. So I have pre-written stories in my curriculum that are recorded that address all of the vocab and structures that I'm addressing in my lessons. So even though my pre-recorded listening activity won't match what we did in class, it doesn't matter. It's still practicing the same things. So I can post that and my kids can do that. So I can assign that particular activity. And that also kind of, it's for those kids again, those one or two kids are gone for a couple of days I can assign this listening activity, which is not only makeup work, but it is also doing the teaching part and eliminates having to do that video part, having to recreate that video. And if you do these in advance and record them, because it doesn't take me very long to record them, they're about two to three minutes each, I can record three, four, five, or six of them at a time and make them available for my students. So I don't have to like, oh my gosh, the students absolutely make one. I have them done in advance. Karen says, I have details of each day plus attachments in Google Classroom since I'm on a cart. I also have an absent students binder where they can get the recent handouts. Love your idea of adding a recording. Yes, works really well. And um, I sympathize you for having to be on a cart. I've never had that. Uh, I've only had to move classrooms once. For one year and it was horrible I had my own classroom but our contract said a teacher could not move more than twice in a day and our Mandarin teacher didn't have a home so she had to move and so I had to give up my room one period so she wouldn't have to move three times and not having all my resources that I normally had was a was really difficult to work with So then that also goes into our reading activity. I do the exact same thing. I will have a pre-written story working the same vocabulary and the same um, structures. Now, I can use 
the reading that we already created for class, or I can use another one. I can create one that so it's a little bit different. Or as I said, in my curriculum, I have them already written out, which are different from the ones we did in class so the kids can practice with those. And again, I make it available on my learning uh, management system and they can actually go right ahead and practice the reading and answer the questions. And where I post both my listening and my reading activities is another online app. It is free. I pay for the additional options. Formative.com. I pay $15 a month and it's worth it for me because this is a way to do assessments. We do all of our assessments online and there are dozens and dozens of different types of assessments, not just multiple choice and fill in the blank assessments that you can do here. But I can post my audio and my reading text to formative.com and then also put 10 questions underneath it and the system will auto grade it. So there's nothing I have to do. I've already got the reading. I've already made the listening. I just upload it to formative.com and assign it as an activity rather than a quiz or a test. My kids can take it wherever they are because it's online. They can do it at home and then I get the results right away. So it's perfect. It's a great way for... Um, for us to use the digital in a great way so we don't have to you know, send out work home all the time. We can do it digitally. It is auto graded and having the audio done in advance, as I said, like Elizabeth says, ready to make the audio recordings in advance works really well. I already have the audio recording. So when I'm in lesson three, I just look for the audio recordings that go in lesson three and upload them nice and simple. Elizabeth says, I tend to stick with a specific class story, but who says that I have to stick with those details, especially since these classes made details, in fact, do not matter to the absentees. Exactly. The whole reason we're making up these details is to engage the, the students in front of us in the lesson. If we tell them a story, they won't be as engaged. But for your absentee kid, it doesn't matter what you can't, unless you're doing it live, you're not going to be able to solicit their answers. So whether they're the details from the one in the class or the one that you made, it doesn't really matter. The benefit for them having a different story, though, is when they do come back and you review the class story. Now they've had two different contexts of exposure of the same grammar, vocabulary and structures. So they've gotten two different contexts, not just one. Elizabeth says, stick to. <laughs> My English gets worse at the end of the day. <laughs> I know I'm ready to take a nap. It's been a long day today. And I still got two more days with kids. So listening and reading activities, those are great. The next thing, and this is what I usually assign for my kids on independent study. So if we're currently reading a novel, I will assign them so many chapters. I'll answer your question one more second, one second, Karen. Um, I will assign so many chapters depending on how long they're out. So if they're gone for a week, I usually assign two, maybe three chapters, depending on how long they are. Like right now, we're reading Vida y Muerte en la Mata Salvatrucha. The chapters are two to three pages long. And I told you I had that kid who's gone all last week and this week. So I assigned a chapter every other day for him. So he's going to be gone. I think he's gone five, six, seven, eight, like nine days. So... Every second day, I've done a chapter. So I'm asking for like four to five chapters from him. And they've got to write a half a page summary in English about what they read so they know that they understood it. If we're not in the middle of a chapter, then I will assign a book. 
and I'll have them check it out in the library and they'll do the same thing. I will say, you will read these chapters and I want a half a page summary in English of each of those chapters. That's what I tend to do for independent study because I have to have something tangible to turn into the state to get the credit for the attendance. So those half page summaries work really well. A digital assignment, it's hard because it doesn't always print nice and neat for the state to recognize something was done. Anything that's done with video, obviously not gonna happen with being able to print that out. So it works really, really well for the novel chapters. Karen says, do you know that your kids actually listen to your recording as opposed to just reading it? My kids are lazy and may not do both. Well, my stories are different. So the listening activity story and the reading activity story will be two different stories using the same grammatical structures and vocabulary. So they can't just do the reading and answer the questions for the listening and the reading. Each one is a separate thing. I tend to do a lot of variety in my listening and readings because I don't want my kids to get the impression that the goal is for them to memorize the story. That's not the goal. The story is just the vehicle for me to deliver the language. What I want them to learn is the language. And the more contexts that I can present that language in, the more it's in their heads. Karen says, gotcha, you're welcome. So those are novel chapters. And then the last thing I do, and again, this is pre-done in advance, is I will pre-record a video lesson. And I usually put these up on YouTube because it's the easiest place for me to um, store them. I will mark them as unlisted so they're not publicly available and I can just provide the students with the links. I did this a lot during distance learning. When we, the first time we went out in distance learning at the end of the 2019, 2020 school year, we went out on March 13th. We didn't come back until the next school year. Um, and then that was distance learning for the first three months. But the end of that first year was asynchronous learning. We didn't go on Zoom. So we had to provide video lessons for our students. So I made a ton of these. I made a ton of them during that time and I saved them. Usually what I would do is either one of two types of a story. I would either create a movie talk where I'm taking screenshots of all the important scenes and at the end of all the screenshots, I finally show the video, but then I take the time to not only ask the story of the screenshots, but also leave time for them to answer. So I'll ask, I'll go, there is a boy. Was there a boy or was there a girl? And then I wait. That's right, there was a boy. And the boy entered a pet store. Class, did the boy enter Target? No, the boy didn't enter Target. Did the boy enter Walmart? No, the boy didn't all went enter Walmart either. Did the boy go into the grocery store or go into a pet store? That's right, he went into the pet store. So you see, I'm telling the story. I'm asking questions. I'm leaving time in there for them to answer the questions to themselves. And then I answer the questions so they can see if they got it right or wrong. I do that with movie talks. I also do it with what I call storyboards, where I make my own story with clip art. So I'll do a Google slide. I'll have one slide for each frame of the story. My stories might be four to six frames. I make some pictures with clip art from Google. I do a, like a search of clip art, make my story, and then... I'll project that on the screen and I'll start asking questions about the story to create the story and I'm recording it. So the kids are getting a visual and an audio at the same time. 
I save them as YouTube videos, and then I can make them available. So I have maybe 10 to 20 of these that I did during that pandemic time, and I saved them. And so they're available. I have them on my YouTube that I can just bing whenever I need to. Or I make a goal once a month on my prep to record a new one. So I don't get that many. You know, we're in school 10 months. I make 10 new ones a year. I teach three preps. So it's roughly three of them per prep. And that way I keep adding to my library of these. And then whenever kids are absent, I have also this alternative work that they can do. So they're getting exposed to the language. There are going to be comprehension questions that go along with these that they can answer. And they're getting the target language at home. And again, formative.com is great for this because I can upload a video or a link to a video if the video is too big. I can put a link in the video, they can click on it, watch it, and then answer the questions on formative.com and I can make them essay questions, short answer questions, multiple choice questions, true and false questions, um, drag and drop in order, like put in sequence questions. I like doing that one. So I make all the sentences, I scramble them up, and then they have to drag and drop them to put them in the right order. A lot of these things are all available in formative.com. Matching all kinds of activities that they can do. They can even do audio responses to, um, to things. So you might have them answer audio you know, with their voice and record that as well. All of that's available in formative.com. And I love it because I can see it right away. And many of the assignments can be auto-graded or at least partially auto-graded. The, even the short answer can be auto-graded. You'll have to go back and just check because if it's not close enough, they may not give the point, but you can go through and just double check them and give points where needed. But again, it makes my life so much easier. So those are the ways that I deal with absent students. Review with them when they come back, give them notes, Record either my class or video lesson specifically for them. For makeup work, listening activities with pre-recorded uh, listening, reading activities with a pre-written text, novel chapters, or video lessons. Any questions, comments, other ideas that you guys do? While you're talking about that, if you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. It does help me to get this out to more teachers. My goal is trying to get up to 500 um, subscribers by the end of January. We're almost there. We're almost to 400 right now. So if you found this helpful, please give it a like and subscribe so we can get it out to more teachers when YouTube will show it to them. Next week, we are going to be talking about, I just forgot what it was. What are we talking about next week? Um, I already had, let me see what I wrote on my list. I apologize. Uh, it completely escaped me. Our next topic next week. Oh, culture. We're going to be talking about different ways to teach culture and that teaching culture is not just about the food and the holidays. So it is the day after Christmas, 5 p.m. Pacific time, same time, same channel. Um, if you, you can always watch the replay because it will be recorded if you can't show up live. I know it's the holiday, but I want to keep consistent and keep it up going every week without fail. So thank you very much for watching. If you have questions, you can always email me. If you're watching this on the replay, please go ahead and put your questions in the comments. I do check and read them and I'll answer them back for you. But if there are no other questions, 
I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday, whatever holiday you celebrate, and I will see you next week. Have a good week, everybody.